Hello everyone, welcome back. In this video, we're gonna define what an iterated integral is, and we're gonna see how we can use them to help us algebraically evaluate our double integrals. Okay, so we say an iterated integral of our function f over our rectangular region r, which has x go from a to b, and y go from c to d, is gonna be given by the integral from a to b of the integral from c to d of our function f, where we first integrate with respect to y, and then we integrate with respect to x. That's one version of our iterated integral. The other version is just switching the roles of x and y. So in this first iterated integral, we're integrating with respect to y first, and then integrating with respect to x. That's how we say this. And what happens in this process kind of geometrically is we're still slicing our volume up into a bunch of smaller pieces and then adding those back together, but it's gonna be a little bit different geometrically. In our first discussion of a double integral, we sliced our volume up into a bunch of rectangular prisms and then add the volumes of all those rectangular prisms back together. Now with this process using an iterated integral, we're instead taking a bunch of thin slices out of our volume, calculating the area of those slices and then adding those all back together. And so these iterated integrals are eventually gonna help us evaluate these double integrals algebraically using antiderivatives. And the process is actually gonna be similar to what we did when we talked about partial derivatives for our multivariable functions. For partial derivatives, we treated one variable as constant and then did all the other work with the non-constant variable. And something similar is gonna happen here. And so what I mean by that is in our first integral, we take an x value and fix it to a constant number. Similar to how when we were working with our double Riemann sums, we fixed that outer sum to be constant and then ran through the inner sums loop. The same kind of idea is going on here. We're fixing an x value and then running through this inner integral with respect to y. We don't always write it, but we think about having an invisible set of parentheses around the inner and the outer integrals. And so for this first iterated integral, we would first integrate with respect to y, take our answer from that, and integrate it with respect to x. For the second iterated integral, we would first integrate with respect to x, take our answer from that, and integrate with respect to y. And the way we're gonna do this integration is using antiderivatives, and our anti-differentiation process is gonna be a lot like our partial differentiation process. We just treat one variable as a constant. And so just to make sure we really understand the geometry going on in these iterated integrals and how it is different than the geometry for the definition of a double integral that we saw earlier, I want us to look at a couple figures. So remember in our first volume finding process, we took our rectangular region R, broke it into a bunch of sub rectangles and found some uh, volumes of approximating rectangular prisms using that. Then we added all the volumes of those approximating rectangular prisms up. Well, for our iterated integrals, we are instead taking that volume underneath our surface and looking at a bunch of vertical cross sections. We're finding the area of all those cross sections, adding all those cross-sectional areas up, and that's giving us the volume underneath our three-dimensional surface in a different way. And so in this first picture that we see here, we are fixing an x value, fixing a single x value at a time, and then integrating with respect to y, and that's giving us like the area or volume of this little vertical cross-sectional sheet. Then we'd go to a different x value, repeat that process, and then add all those different uh, kind of areas or cross-sectional sheets uh, back together. And that gives us the volume of our three-dimensional region. Or we could do that slicing in the opposite order. So now we're fixing y. And that's still gonna give us a vertical cross-section, but perpendicular to what we were doing before. So we fix a y value, find that cross-sectional area by integrating with respect to x, and then repeat this for all the different y values in our region. All right, so with these iterated integrals, we see a different way of slicing up the volume we are interested in finding. And this next theorem that we are gonna write down is basically saying that these iterated integrals, this other way of finding our volume is legitimate and is equivalent to the first approach we used. And it also is gonna say that the order of integration really doesn't matter, especially when we're working with rectangular regions. All right, and so Fubini's theorem says, if our function of two variables, x and y, is continuous over our rectangular region r, then the double integral of our function is equivalent to our iterated integrals for the function. In this example, we're asked to find the exact volume of the region below the surface given by f of x comma y is equal to x plus 2y over the rectangular region r, which is the rectangle going from 0 to 3 and from 0 to 3 in both the x and y direction. And so if we want to find this volume, we have to compute the double integral over our region of the function f or x plus 2y. 
and Fubini's theorem is going to allow us to do this algebraically. We're going to be able to do this using one of our iterated integrals. And we're going to show in this example that no matter which iterated integral we use, we're going to get the exact same answer. In this example, it won't make a significant difference of which order of integration we choose to use. In other examples, though, the order of integration may make the antiderivatives a lot easier or more difficult to find. All right, so let's go ahead and first evaluate this uh, double integral using an iterated integral, where we're going to integrate with respect to y first, and then integrate with respect to x. So we'll first write this as the integral from 0 to 3 of the integral from 0 to 3 of our function x plus 2y. We're first integrating with respect to y, and then integrating with respect to x. So let's put a little extra set of brackets or parentheses around this to help us stay focused. So to start, we have to find an antiderivative with respect to y of the function x plus 2y. And so this antiderivative is going to be some function that when we differentiate it with respect to y, we return to x plus 2y. And so when we are anti-differentiating with respect to y, we treat all the other variables like a constant. So x is like a constant. So what is the antiderivative of a constant? It's a constant times our variable. So the antiderivative of that first term with respect to y is going to be x times y. And if we want to find the antiderivative of 2y with respect to y, we're going to have to use our power rule. And that will give us y squared as the antiderivative of 2y. And so now we have our antiderivative. It's going to look like xy plus y squared. We have to evaluate it at the upper limit of integration and then subtract away from that our antiderivative evaluated at the lower limit of integration. After that, we'll get some function involving only x. And then we can finish this all off by doing that second iterated integral and integrating our answer with respect to x. And so one other quick little note about this antiderivative. It's, it's not the most general antiderivative of our function, right? Remember, whenever we find an antiderivative, we have some constant c. Something similar happens here when we find antiderivatives or partial antiderivatives. However, if we think about this, if we were to take uh, the derivative with respect to y, any constant would disappear, but any function of x would also disappear. So technically, when we find an antiderivative of a multivariable function, there is now not going to be a constant of integration but a function of the other variables uh, involved. We found our antiderivative with respect to y. And so remember, these are y values we are plugging into our antiderivative, not x values. If we plug in y equals 3, we're going to get 3x plus 3 squared, or 9. And then we technically have to subtract away from that our antiderivative evaluated at y equals 0. But that's going to make everything 0 out. So after integrating with respect to y, we are left with the integral in terms of just x, and it's the integral from 0 to 3 of 3x plus 9. And so that's one thing to note. Once you've evaluated one of your iterated integrals, like the integral with respect to y, there should be no more of those variables showing up in your process. If you still have a y showing up after you've completed your integration with respect to y, then you have made an error somewhere along the way. So there's no y's involved, so that's a good sign. Now we have to finish this off by integrating with respect to x. This one should be much more straightforward. It's what we've been doing for a while. Our antiderivative of 3x is going to be 3x squared over 2. And our antiderivative of 9 is going to be 9x. We have to evaluate this at 3 and 0 and then split the difference. Our lower limit of integration is just going to give us a bunch of zeros. So we'll get out of this just by evaluating our function or our antiderivative at the upper limit of integration. And so well, if we plug in x equals 3 into 3x squared over 2 plus 9x, we're going to get 81 over 2, or 40.5. So let's go ahead and make a little note of that off to the side. Our first time through this example, when we integrated with respect to y and then with respect to x, we found this volume to be 40.5. And so now we're going to run through this example again, but by switching the order of integration, and we should see that no matter what order of integration we use, we're going to get the same value for this volume of 40.5. All right, so the second time around for this example, now we're going to integrate with respect to x and then with respect to y. But it's still going to look like the integral from 0 to 3 of the integral from 0 to 3. Our function is x plus 2y. The big difference is now the order of integration is dx and then dy. So it didn't look like our limits of integration switched here, but technically they did. If we did have different intervals for x and y, we have to make sure to change the values of the inner and outer limits of integration.
Okay, so now we're integrating with respect to x, and so that means we're going to think and treat y as if it is a constant. And so the antiderivative of x is just going to be x squared over 2. We add to that the antiderivative of the constant 2y. The antiderivative of 2y with respect to x is going to be 2xy. So our antiderivative with respect to x is x squared over 2 plus 2xy. We can't forget to evaluate that. And also remember that this is still inside of our outer integral or the integral with respect to y. So our antiderivative of x squared over 2 plus 2xy, we're now evaluating it at the upper limit of integration, which is when x is equal to 3, and that will give us 9 over 2 plus 6y. Technically, we have to subtract away from this first quantity the value we get from our antiderivative when we evaluate it at x equals 0. But that makes everything go to 0, so we're just subtracting a 0 away and don't really need to write that. So we've just finished our integration with respect to x, and notice there are no longer any x's involved inside of our integral. That should always be happening. The only variable that is left is the variable of y. And so now we can integrate with respect to y. The antiderivative of 9 halves is going to be 9 halves times y, and the antiderivative of 6y is going to be 3y squared. We have to evaluate that at 3 and 0 and take the difference. And well, if we plug in uh, y equals 3, we're again going to get 81 over 2, or 40.5. So no matter which order we use in this example, we're going to get the same value for either iterated integral.